Good morning. Uh, after last week, there were several questions came to me uh, about PCPs and their function. And those are words that I use that not everybody, uh, precinct committee persons, okay? And so uh, every county party has a number of functions that PCPs can be involved in. But beyond that, there are some other, other things where, where you can get involved. Uh, typically, it happens because you're connected up with people who have like interests. And so I want to share with you some stuff that I know about that's gone on in the last few years where PCPs have, have decided to get involved, and it wasn't necessarily a county party function, okay? Uh, the, the first that, I, that came to mind is a number of years ago, I think it was back in 2019, there was a young lady who lived in Mill City, and she thought it would be a good idea to do what she called a meet and greet, to, to bring local elected officials together to meet some of the county uh, party members and some of the elected officers in the party. Now, Mill City is two counties. It's in Marion and Lynn. And so she'd invited the chair and the vice chair and, and various members of both parties, plus the council and, and the mayor. And we actually were at the, at the mayor's uh, restaurant. I think it's his wife's restaurant, actually. Okay. And it, it went over well, and out of that, uh, they decided to do the same kind of function in, in seven other locations throughout the county. We got three of those done before COVID hit, okay? And then, of course, with COVID, it kind of went on the side. Uh, in, during 2020, in our, in our county office, there were a few of us talking about what it is we ought to be doing besides promoting the president and the, and the major positions. And out of that, we were checking on who had filed for various city positions, and we found two positions in two small cities where no one had filed. And so we said, well, I wonder what the probability is of being able to get somebody elected using a write-in. So talk to the county clerk about the process, and we put together uh, a little bit of uh, of a campaign for these two. One of them wanted yard signs and some handouts, and the other one just wanted some handouts. And I think we spent a big big chunk of money, I think it was a couple of hundred dollars, and we got both of them elected. And we went, hey, this seems like you know, an easy thing to do. So the same group expanded then to about six or seven people, and we began to look at the upcoming election in May for, uh, for special districts, and we focused on the K through 12 schools, and there was another group involved with the large gaps district where they had three people running, and so we kind of connected up with them and looked at, the, at other positions, and in that election, we were able to get 15 of 17 people that we promoted elected, okay? And, and it, it took uh, about $3,000 for, for the stuff outside of gaps, I think gaps, uh, the, those folks doing that election spent somewhere between 30, around $30,000 doing that because it, it was a big area. But the rest of it, about three grand, and we were able to get a number of people elected. Just very recently, uh, a friend of mine who's a PCP in Benton County uh, was interested in, in the election next spring of special districts and it's school election again, and so he attends a church in Lynn County, lives in Benton County, but attends a church in Lynn County. Speaking with his pastor, they decided, why don't we invite in a group called uh, Parents' Rights in Education. They have an office in Salem, and they asked the lady who, who runs that office if she'd come speak, and they have a meeting set up, an information meeting set up for uh, next Sunday, I believe it is the 23rd, whatever that, I think that's next Sunday, okay? For the 23rd, four to six in the afternoon, to talk about what parents' rights are, you know, what are the parents' rights associated with K through 12 schools? Um, then very recently, the PCPs that I'm associated with in, in our big district of Millersburg, there are six of us. We got together and said, what are some things we ought to be able to do? And we, we focused on two items. We had some yard signs commissioned uh, that are vote no on all four of the ballot issues. And then we did door drops 
on the 70 some Republicans that are registered in our district that had not voted in the last four elections. Now, each, each, there are four groups of us, and each of us took a fourth of those. And in the group that I had, I noticed that in one case, there was a house we never did find, okay? One of them was obviously a drug house, but several of them were people who had moved in recently, that the people who had been there that hadn't voted had gone, because I had one gentleman follow me out to the car and said, hey, I've voted for the last 70 years, and I'm, we're on the same, same sheet here. So, you know, th that, that was reassuring for me. So another piece of business, the, the last day that you can change your registration is Tuesday, the 18th, okay? And I had thought, if I had thought about it earlier, I would have tried to set up out in the foyer with a computer so you could check your registration. If you want to check your voter registration, it's really simple. Go to the Oregon Secretary of State's office, find the button that says vote, or election, okay? Either one of those will take you to the same place, and you can check your registration. All you need is your date of birth, and your, and your driver's license number, and your name, of course, and you go in and find out, am I really registered the way that I think I, I, I wanted to be registered? Because if you've had inter, inter, any interaction with the Department of Motor Vehicles in the past year, okay, th there is a possibility that your registration has been changed to unaffiliated. Now, that's not going to be a bother for this election, but that'll be a bother for you next spring, okay? And, and I recommend people go at least twice a year and check their voter registration. It's a computer. It's got no conscience, okay? And so it just does whatever the algorithms tell it to do, all right? So which brings us to today. If you're following along in the book, we should be on page 68, we're going to look at the Oregon, the elected in Oregon at the state level. It's also important to keep in mind that, that my purpose here is to provide you with resources, processes, and information that will assist you in becoming an informed voter. I'm not here to make you into an informed voter. So and if you want to be an informed voter, here are the sources, okay? because you don't want me to do the other part, okay? So here's what we're gonna to try to get done today. Who are the six members of the executive branch and their term of office in the state of Oregon? Where do I find information on elected officials? Where, are there places I can go to get that? What are the number of state, senate, and house districts in Oregon? The senate and house districts representing Lynn, Benton, and Marion counties, what are those? Oregon senators and house, members representing Lynn, Benton, and Marion counties, and the length of term of office for the House and Senate in Oregon, okay? So we're just focused on Oregon, more focused just on our three counties here. So at the executive level, here, here are the three. The governor, it's a four-year term limited to two terms in any 12 years. Kate, of course, this is her last year. If you look at some literature, it will tell you, say, well, she, her term expires in 2023. It's true. It expires January the 3rd, 2023, okay? But I say her term of office expires this year, okay? Secretary of State, same deal. Four-year term, limited to eight years in any 12. That term expires in 2024. So if you're interested in a replacement for that, now is the time to start working on finding somebody to fill that position. Then Tobias, his term expires in 2024 also. Okay? Same issue there. The Attorney General, that's a four-year term with no term limits. Okay? Uh, Ellen was first elected in 2012. She will be on the 2024 ballot her term expires January of 2025. The Commissioner of Bureau and Labor and of Labor and Industry, it's a big long term, okay? It's a four-year term, no term limits. Val has had that position since 2018. She did not run for that position, okay? She's run instead for Congressional District 4, okay? So that position is on the ballot this year, okay? 
Then the one that always concerns me is what we call now the Deputy Superintendent of Public Education. Until 2011, this was an elected position. It is now an appointed position that happened out of Senate Bill 552. So if you want to look at the details, go, go take a look at Senate Bill 552. It's online, okay? He was appointed in 2018. Now on top of that, all seven of the school board positions State school board positions in Oregon are appointed by the governor. And I don't care whether it's a Democrat or Republican governor, I don't want a governor to have that much authority, okay? This was changed by a Senate bill. It can be changed back to election by a Senate bill. So if you have a connection with a House member or a Senate member, because it could start in either place, and you'd like to see that to be an elected position, now would be the time to be talking about that because the House and Senate will meet starting in February of next year. At the executive branch, this is the governor position. We have these three running. Christine, Tina, and Betsy are all running here. Right now, it looks like it's almost a toss-up between Christina and, uh, and Tina. Betsy could be the spoiler on either side of this, okay? I want to remember that Betsy was a Republican at one time, then she was a Democrat for one time, long time, and then she got out of the party and said, I'm going to run as an unaffiliated. The, the, the literature will often say she's running as an independent. Independent is a party in Oregon, so she's running as unaffiliated. The commissioner position, we have uh, Sherry and Christina running as commissioner. I would encourage you to look uh, 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 information about them, and I'll show you where here in a second, right here. Th th these are the best sources that I know of to do quick looks at candidates. Ballot Media, okay, does an excellent job, and there will be links there if, if they're already elected, links to lots of other sources. Then the one down at the bottom, the, the Just Facts Vote Smart, okay, it's an excellent site gives you all kinds of background information about candidates, including their finances. Uh, if you go to the Oregon legislature, you know, here, here's the challenge there. We had redistricting of House and Senate seats. So if you go to this site, what you'll find is the, a description and a map of their current House or Senate district. Now, that's not the one that they're running for election for. The one they're running for election for, there'll be a, be a tab somewhere on the site that you can click to get a map of the district they're running for, okay? Because the current districts are in place until January. The districts they're running for start in January, but they're running for them now, okay? There's probably a way to make it more confusing, but I don't know quite how I could have done that, but, but that's the way it is. So I want to talk about the legislative branches that affect our three counties, okay? So there are 30 state Senate districts in Oregon. Each Senate district has, they say, 141,214 citizens. Now that number's gonna change, okay? That's the population at 2020. Senators serve for a four-year term with no term limits. We did pass term limits at one time, it lost uh, when it got to the court system. It's one of those deals where we take a political problem and try to resolve it in the courts, okay? That's unfortunate, but th that's the way it is. Every two years, half of the 30 senators will be on the ballot, okay? And they're on the ballot in even number years. So this year, about half the senators are on the ballot. So if you're following along in, in the book, you'll find some small changes because I go through this thing several times before I get here, and one of them is, is this page here. Uh, this is two pages, and in your book it's one. So this is the criteria that was set up for the redistricting, okay? So it said each district had to be as practical, shall as practical, shall be contiguous, be equal of population, utilize existing geographic and political boundaries, not be divided, communities of common interest not connect, must be connected by transportation links. 
And then it goes on with some other stuff. No district shall be drawn for the purpose of favoring any political party, incumbent, legislature, or other person. Now, if, if you look at this stuff very carefully, you'll, you'll just fall down laughing with, with that. I mean, it's, I mean, it could be the law, it just didn't happen, okay? So here, here are the positions that represent our three counties. And notice that, that Sarah, who represents Marion, also Lynn, and also Benton, not in total, but her district connects up to those three. And then Fred, he's, part of his district is in Marion County and part of it is Lynn County. And I want to caution you, if you're thinking about how it, how it is now, okay, this is not quite true. This is how it will be January 1. So all of this from here on, I'm going to talk about districts as they will occur. So Marion County... It, it, is represented by four pieces of four separate districts, eight, nine, 10, and 11, okay? And, and these are the individuals that represent those districts today. They won't necessarily represent them in January. For instance, Peter Courtney didn't run, or excuse me, I take that back. He got beat in, in the primary, okay? All right? So, Within these four districts, all of Marion is covered, also portions of Clackamas, Lynn, and Polk counties get covered by, by these four districts. So Sarah represents Lynn Benton and Marion. She's in District 8, and this is the map as it will occur in January 3 of District 8. It's not how 8 looks now, it's how 8 will look, okay? She's on the ballot this year, okay? Then Fred, Fred's district changed quite a bit. It now runs way up here into, into Clackamas. Here's Marion, and it's got a little chunk of, of Lynn down here, okay? So he'll be on the, on the ballot in 2024, if he runs again. Deb is District 10. Now notice that District 10 includes a piece of Polk County over here, okay? And this chunk out here too, I think that's uh, Monmouth and Independence, okay? She's on the ballot this year. And then Peter says he did not run in 2022, but that's the way life is, okay? So he has been there since 1998, and it's a good thing that he's not running. So this is his district. So Senate District 8 that Sarah is in that represents portions of all three of our counties but a big chunk of Marion. Okay, she's running against a, a lady by the name of Valerie Dra Draper Woldite, okay, who is, is a newbie. Okay, this is the first time she's ever run for election. Senate District 10, you've got Deb and Rachel running for Senate District 10. And then 11, you've got Eric and Kim, okay, and, and I would encourage you, you know, if you've got the publication that's got their names on them, you can go look these up in ballot media. You can look about each of these individuals in ballot media, okay? Lynn County. Lynn County is three Senate districts, six, eight, and nine, okay? And so, we've got Lee Breyer, we've got Sarah, and we have Fred. So, six, eight, and nine covers... Portions of Lane, Lynn, Marion, Clackamas, and Benton counties. Okay? So it gets scattered way out there. So let's look at them individually. So here's Lee. Lee's run way down here in Delane County. Okay? And it's got a big chunk of Lynn, nearly all of Lynn. Okay? And as mentioned earlier, Sarah, now you'll see some repeat here because some of these people are representing three counties, okay? So it's got this chunk of, whoops, back up, Skeet. What'd I do? Push the wrong buttons. Okay, this is, this is Benton County over here, and here's Marion, this piece of it up here, okay? 
So if you're an individual that's involved in supporting one of these candidates or working with them, it's important to try to figure out how can we work with people on these other counties because the election will be in, in pieces of all three of these and your candidate could win in one of the counties and lose in the other two or win in two and lose in one and it could be a big enough number to sw swing it. So it's important if you're working with these candidates that you're aware of, of the size of their district and have connections with people in the other counties. Okay, and we talked about Fred already. It represents part of Marion, Clackamas, and Lynn. Okay? So if you're in Marion County and you, and you want to work on Fred's election you know, in, in 2024, you need to be connecting up with people in Lynn and also in, in Clackamas County. So on this, the ballot this year, in 2022, Senate District 6 is Ashley and Cedric. And then, as I mentioned earlier, eight is, is Sarah and Valerie. Takes us to Benton County. Benton County is Senate Districts 5 and 8, okay? Dick Anderson and Sarah represent that. So, so they're not represented by quite so many people because it's a small county. But these districts include portions of Benton, Lane, Douglas, and Coos, okay? So this runs clear down here, okay, this district, okay? It's a large geographical area. So this gentleman represents Senate District 5. He's not on the ballot until 2024. Uh, it's an interesting deal. I, I've never seen this gentleman at a Republican Party meeting, and I don't think anybody in... Benton County at the Central Committee meetings have seen him either, okay? Um, so it's like maybe we ought to send out an invitation here and s see if we can talk to this guy. All right, th there's Sarah again. Remember, it's, it's between these two for Senate District 8, okay? Which then brings us to the House seats. Each Senate district in Oregon is divided into two House districts within that Senate district. That means there are 60 House seats, 30 Senate seats. That means in Salem, there will be 90 people, 9-0, representing everyone in the state of Oregon. Okay? So if you wanted to have a majority in the House, how many of your party would you have to have elected? If it's the House, have to have at least 30. If you happen to have 35, that's called a supermajority. And when you've got a supermajority, the other party usually doesn't get much say so. All right. So representatives are on the ballot every two years on the even numbered years. So 2022, 24, 26, 28, okay? So if you have a senator, and, and they're, they're not on the ballot this year, and you're wanting to ha come against them or you want to support them, they'll be on the ballot in two years. So those are four-year terms. These are all two-year terms. So every, every two years, every House member in the state of Oregon is on the ballot. And every federal House member is on the ballot. So Marion County... I feel bad for Marion County. It's divided up into seven house districts, 15, 17, 18, 90, 20, 21, and 22. And it includes connections into Lynn and Benton counties, to Clackamas County and Polk County. So if you're at the county level and you're trying to deal with this, you've got a lot of outreach to do to be effective. So here's Shelley. Shelley, you know, I've known Shelley for some time, but her district, look at, look at this. But besides being in Lynn, it goes over in a little bit of Benton County, and then it shoots off up in, in Demarion. And I, I don't know whether I mentioned it before, but in the redistricting, in order to keep her within her district, the, the new line runs right through their farm property. 
it keeps her house over in House District 15, but part of the farm is in the neighboring House District. Okay? All right, now here's one that gets really confusing. That's Jamie Kate. Jamie is presently in House District 17 in the redrawn boundaries. She'll be in House District 11. Okay? I mean, it makes it really hard when you're trying to figure out about these people. And that's the reason I've got the unknown down here. It's like, we don't know who's going to be here because it's not going to be her. Okay? So House District 18 is Marion and Clackamas County. Okay? And it, it's Rick Lewis. And then Rachel is a House District 19 which you can see is a big part of the city of Salem, okay? I mean, most of this is Salem. Because remember, we're trying to have equal kinds of populations, so, you know, it's easy to draw around the, the boundaries there, okay? House District 20. Now, House District 20 get, gets, uh, gets confusing because it runs over into Polk County, so here's, here's a piece of Polk. There's some more Polk County there. And then this is Marion running off up here. Okay? Then Chris was in 2021. He didn't run for uh, this year. I don't know why. Uh, but he was appointed in 2022 to fill a position. And then he decided not to refile. So... This, again, is a small geographic area, but it's a lot of people. It's all in Marion, okay? Then, then Teresa was first elected in 2018. She made the choice to not run in 2022. And so you've got two, two house districts here that are wide open in terms of people running for them. And always get interested about how they were able to carve this stuff out along these funny, funny lines here. I mean, th this is one of those situations where your neighbor across the street could be in a different house district. So, Shelley is running for house district 15, okay, in, in this election. She's running against Benjamin. And then Ed, Ed here, he, he's out in front because he's running un un uncontested in House District 17, which used to be Jamie Kate's district, okay? So, so often when I'm talking about House District 17, people are thinking about Jamie, and it's like, no, it's not there anymore. She didn't move, they just moved the lines, okay? So in A18, you've got two newbies, okay? Same way I believe in 19, okay? 20 and 21, okay? So in, in Marion County, because you've got this high population and all these small districts, this gets to be difficult when you get a small group together and say, all right, we're going to compare notes on candidates because... If you're on the wrong, the other side of the street, it could be, you know, a different candidate. Remember, the ballots will go in the mail on Wednesday. Okay? You should have your ballot by the end of the week. Okay? If your ballot does not show up by the first part of next week, okay, by about Tuesday, if you don't have a ballot, go to the courthouse. Okay? Don't call, don't send a letter. Don't send an email, okay? Go in person to the courthouse and go, I didn't get a ballot, okay? Then House District 22, we have these two running, Anthony and Tracy. And then we come to Lynn County. Now, we're more fortunate in Lynn County, we've only got three house districts, 11, 15, and 17, but we share 15 with Marion and Benton, and we share 17 with Marion. Okay? So, this piece up here, that's 17. 11 is this 
got this funny little jog in it here. This is 11, okay? It's around like so. And then we've got 15 right in here, okay? And, the, and it's got a piece that extends over into North Albany, okay? It gives us part of Benton County. Is this getting confusing? It is from up here, okay? All right. Now, now here's, this, here's an example of, that goes against that deal. You won't, you won't do something when you're redistricting that, that makes it so somebody, you know, is a disadvantage. Well, Marty, Marty has been the uh, House representative for House District 11 for a long time. When they redistrict, when they did the redistricting, they changed the shape of 11. And uh, Marty looked at the data and said, Th this district is very heavily Republican. There isn't any way that I'm going to have a good chance of winning the district. So he decided not to run. Okay? So this is the district that Jamie is running in now. Okay? And Shelley, of course, we mentioned already a couple of times. House District 15. And Jamie was 17, okay? So let's see if we can bring it down to who's what now. So House District 11, even though Jamie is an incumbent, she's not an incumbent for 11. So she's running against Mary, okay? And then Shelley, of course, has got the job of running against Benjamin. And it's a, it's a tough battle for Benjamin because Shelley has a pretty tight hold on, on her district. And then, of course, Ed doesn't have any competition, and therefore he's not spending much money in the election. All right, coming down to Benton County, okay? So, Benton is easier. It's only got three house seats, okay? House District 10, 15, and 16, okay? But notice that, that 10 is Lincoln and Lane counties, and 15 is Marion and Lynn, that's Shelley Bosart Davis's district. And then 16, lo and behold, that's all Benton County, okay? So this is the incumbent. David is the incumbent in, in House District 10. Shelley, of course, we've mentioned is in 15. And, and Dan in 16, okay? So here's, here we're coming down to the election, okay? We've got David versus uh, Calestra. Calestra, I think is the way you pronounce her name, okay? Celesta, thank you. I know I didn't do that right, but I got close. I got the first letter, right? Okay. Uh, and Shelley, of course, um, Then Ray is running against a newbie, Keith, okay? Uh, I have happened to have a chance to meet this gentleman, Keith. Uh, he's, uh, I think, semi-retired is what I would say. He was uh, overseas for a number of years. Uh, has a, a very interesting and detailed background dealing with uh, intelligence, okay? Uh, he's an interesting person to talk to. I mean, even if you're not voting for him or pr promoting him or running against him. If you wanted a good conversation, I would highly recommend him to give you some idea of the stuff that went on in Afghanistan that we don't know about. Okay? It's a little bit like a friend of mine who in the, in the Vietnam War was in Cambodia when we weren't in Cambodia. It's that kind of deal, okay? So in summary, here, our three counties are represented by 16 elected positions, okay? Six senators, 10 representatives. So if you're wanting to make an impact on some piece of legislation, you need to make a contact with the people representing your area. And in, in one of the lessons, we'll do it after the election, I go through how to do that, okay? How's, how's the best way to contact a legislator and, and be able to get 
an audience, so to speak, with them, whether it's written or in person. What is that process? So I'll go through that. Uh, they don't meet again until February, okay? So stuff that goes on in legislation, I don't know that we have to worry about it a whole lot now, except here's the little caveat. If you wanted to get a bill before the next legislature, if you say, you know, I'm really interested in having a House or Senate bill to do blah, 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 and I got a lawyer friend that helped me kind of draft some stuff, okay? That draft bill should have been to the Legislative Council people in September, okay? Showing up with a new bill in January or February uh, will not get you much traction unless it's something that's really dramatic, okay? Because the bills that are gonna show up, most of them are already in the Legislative Council. They don't have a number yet, you can't track them, okay? But, but they're there. And then the last general session, there were between three and 4,000 bills that, that were, went into the, into the front door at the legislature. Not all of them made it to the floor, but it'll be a huge number. And there, it's just not even possible for any legislator to even look at that number of bills, let alone have any understanding of them. Okay? So, questions. Now, somebody was going to handle the microphone. We've got about five minutes. Wait till he gets the microphone. There's one back here. What are you doing way back there? What, these guys get paid for this, and how much? Do they all have other jobs, or is this something they do for a living? The, the House and Senate? Yeah. You know, I can't, I can't remember. I, I think... I, I don't remember. I, okay. it, it's a paid position, okay? They get paid plus a stipend. I think this, the only one that I can remember, I think the stipend's 151 a day, okay? But there's also a salary, okay? And I, th I think the salary is in the $30,000, $40,000 range. I mean, it, it's, it's not a salary you're going to support a family on. Got it. Okay? Somebody down here had a question. I mean, it's not a job you want to take in order to get because of the pay. Thank you for doing this. Um, so, so do the Senate and House bill numbers, um, th they rotate through, right? And they repeat the numbers, but do they stop repeating them if it becomes a bill? How does, how does the numbering work? The, ho the House and Senate bill numbering system? Let me deal with that one. I mean, I've got a, I've got a lesson we're going to do that deals with that, that piece. Uh, so far, the numbers haven't... They, they haven't reused the numbers, okay? They just get... You know, they just add on each year. Not every bill that shows up at the Legislative Council gets a number. It won't get a number until uh, somebody wants to bring it to the floor, okay? And I'm not talking about the voting floor, but it's got to get into committee, okay? And it's at that point that it gets a number, okay? And it depends on where it started. Did it start with a House member or a Senate member? And some, and th there are three groups. There's House, Senate, and Joint Committees. There's, there's those three committees. And I will talk about how that's structured and share what it is I think I know, okay? Because it, it's really a complicated deal. Somebody over here had it. How do we find out which bills are actually in front of the legislators? You said there were three to 4,000 of them, but some of them make it in. Okay. Let's see. And I will go through this in, in, in detail, okay? Not today, but I have a lesson where I'm going to go through this in detail. Once a bill is assigned a number, okay? You can track it from that point on. There is a process called uh, e-follow, 
So if you, if you find a bill that you want to track, if you click on it you know, and give it your email address, you will be able to track every step that it takes. And I tell people to be cautious about how many bills you click on, okay? Because you'll get a notice every time there's a change to the bill, every time there's a meeting scheduled, a meeting got canceled, a meeting got changed, there was a, an alteration to the bill, it went back to, you know, everything that happens to that bill, you'll get an email on, okay? And the first time I did it, I picked about a dozen bills, and, and it's like, no, no, you need to pick one or two. Okay. But I will go through that. I was going to say, you can also join groups that are things you're interested in, like we homeschool, so anything, any bill related to education, I want to know about, and so we're part of the Oregon um, Homeschool Network, and they will alert us to anything, which right. is, so they do the work. I was yeah. going to ask about the... Let, let, let me come back to that, because there's, there's two pieces here. One of them is to, to, to figure out what committee is dealing with the, information, you know, the, the bills that you might be interested in. That's one piece. The other one, what organizations? Uh, one of my favorite organizations is the, the, parents, the parents' rights group. Okay? They will also be tracking bills. Okay? So, go ahead. So, the redistricting, is that also called gerrymandering? No? Well, you're laughing. <laughs> I'm sorry. The redistricting, is yeah. that also, is it the same thing as gerrymandering? Is that the same thing? Well, it happened during that. You know, gerrymandering was actually a guy's name. Yes, I okay. vaguely remember. But, but we yes, didn't I always mean, do that. you can see by the shape of those, okay, yeah. uh, there was some attempt to keep Pre voting precincts within, you know, not, not to cut them, but that, that didn't always happen. Okay. Why don't we just go by county and have a representative for a county? Let's see, remember my comment, if you want to make yeah. a change in the way the state <laughs> does stuff, it has to start at the legislature, okay? I'm, and I'm not trying to put you off, I'm saying, I tru you know, <laughs> truly, if you want to make a change in the way something happens, you have to look and go, is this something that's in the Constitution? If it's a constitutional change, now we need a ballot measure, okay? If it's a process that you're wanting to have changed, now that's a legislative issue, okay? Right? And... That's my terms, but not all things that, are legis that we do by legislation are called legislative issues, okay? Uh, there, are, there are some things that go on there that it's very difficult to change with legislation, okay? But, but if you're saying there's a process, like, why don't we just divide it up by county, okay? Have to go look and see, is that in the Constitution, or is that something the legislature put together? The legislature put together the redistricting, okay? Uh, Shelley Bosart Davis was on that committee originally, and because she wouldn't follow what Kate wanted done, she, they said, no, I'm sorry, you're no longer on that yeah. committee. Yeah. Okay? So they, sh they changed her district, but they kept her in her district by putting the line through the farm, okay? I mean, payback's not good sometimes. Yeah. All right, it's, it's 11 o'clock, and I think that's when I'm supposed to start, stop, okay? So thank you, and, and, and let's ask the Lord to be with us here. So Heavenly Father, I'm, I thank you for, for allowing us to be born and live in a country where we're able to have differences of opinion about our elected officials, and we're actually able to, to vote and elect people th that we want to support. And Lord, I would ask your, your interference, so to speak, but, but your blessing upon this, le le this election, that it would be honest and truthful, and, and those that are called by your name would be first on the list to be elected. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. There is strength within the sorrow.